What's up, PlayCon? Welcome to the Fallout 76 panel. You guys excited? I see some really cool cosplayers over there. Welcome. Yeah. All right, ready to get started? I'm Gary Steinman. Oh, somebody loves you, Todd. You should all put your masks on. <laughs> we, need, we need a mask. Yeah. A mask picture. All right, hold on. <laughs> all right, there we go. Love it. That's awesome. <laughs> so I'm Gary Steinman, and for the next hour, I'll be chatting with the team from Bethesda Game Studios, picking your brains about Fallout 76, getting the answers to lots of questions, questions we gathered from a lot of you guys in the community, the tough questions that they've been dying to hear answers for. But before we jump in, I'd love to play the official trailer for Fallout 76, the one we debuted at E3 two months ago, because honestly, I could watch that trailer again and again and again. So why don't we all watch it together again right now? years after our great nation began, we gather together to honor the completion of Vault 76. This sprawling underground shelter may have been engineered by Vault Tech, but it was built by you. So that if the bombs do come, our way of life will endure. Almost heaven. West Virginia, Blue Ridge Mountains, Shenandoah River. Life is all there, older than the trees, younger than the mountains, blowing like the breeze. Country roads, take me home to the place I belong. When the fighting has stopped and the fallout has settled, you must rebuild. Not just walls, not just buildings, but hearts and minds, and ultimately, America itself. In Vault 76, our future begins. It doesn't get old. No, it doesn't. I mean, everyone we're started clapping. I seriously, I got goosebumps. Yeah, yeah. it's like a <laughs> religious awesome. experience, like a communal experience. Hearing people, watching some of you sing along to the song, it's amazing. Stuck in my head for another month. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> stuck in our heads forever. So let's get started. I'd like to introduce the team here, uh, starting with development director Chris Meyer, who. <laughs> who also happens to be a local, or extended local. You're right down the road in Austin. Austin, in Texas. Austin I've, studio, I've been yeah. there since 95, so yeah. it's, it's a great city, Austin. Project leader, Jeff Gardner. And of course, game director, Todd Howard. So, and Gary. And, and, well, I introduced myself. 
Well, I'm Gary. Gary. <laughs> <laughs> I promise tough questions and they'll come, but let's start with an easy one, or what should be an easy one. Todd, what exactly is Fallout 76? That's a good question. Uh, I mean, the, the short answer is, I think people know, Fallout 76 is an open world RPG set in the, in the Fallout universe um, that has a lot of systemic and survival qualities. Um, and, and the big difference with Games, other games or games that we've done are that there are, every character you see is a, is a real human um, that is playing the game, and that creates some really uh, exciting scenarios that, that we never can anticipate. You used uh, the word systemic, and we've got Chris here who worked on one of the granddaddies of all systemic online games, Ultima Online. And now you're working on Fallout 76. <laughs> Tell us about your journey to... to, to, to to, to work on this game, but, uh, but also your excitement, your experience, and what you're bringing to Fallout 76 in terms of that kind of systemic online game. But Ultima Online is the reason I'm in the industry. It was the, the first game I worked on and how I cut my teeth working on sandbox games with lots and lots of players. Um, so it is a dream come true to sort of bring that experience to the Fallout universe, which is a beloved franchise for me personally. And what do you do? So, Jeff, what do you do hour to hour, minute to minute in the game. I mean, people know what Fallout, uh, what a Fallout game is and what you do in a Fallout game. Is it similar here? Do you have quests? Do you have uh, activities? What goes on? You have quests, tons of systemic activities. I mean, it's very similar to the Fallout you know and love. The, the major difference is obviously, as you've heard, it's online. And there's a lot of tension created with other characters. Are they friendly? Are they foes? We really dug into the survival elements and the crafting elements of the game, the workshop and camp elements. So we really hope it's, it's really like a place that once you're in it, you're, you're sucked in for hours. We find at work, like, we're just sucked hours go by, and we're like, oh, my God, I, I got work to do. Uh, huh. and we're still playing the game. So it's wonderful. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, I think it's and people who, who come to the office and, and play it, at first, they're like, this is, this is the fallout I know and love. So I think like 80% of it probably is the fallout everyone is used to, and the other 20% is really different. Um, and it's, so it's at times a little hard to explain, um, you know, this is the flow and how it feels, because at one point it's comfortable, on the other side it's, it's all new. Which, which brings me to another uh, variation on that question. Is this, is this the right game for fallout fans? Well, I think so, but I don't really know. <laughs> um, there are so many types of Fallout fans, right? Um, you see everybody here, and there's so many things in our games, and some people love just the exploration, the character building, the stories, the combat, um, crafting, and so um, it has all of those things. Obviously, the thing it doesn't have are N NPCs that are going to be specific characters that tell you a story that, that we've written. Um, we love those things. We understand a lot of our fans love those things. And this one replaces that with the other, the other players. They are the interesting NPCs, um, and hopefully in a lot of ways more interesting than what we may create on our own. So that, that part's very different. I can't say it's, you know, better or worse, um, but, I, you know, when you but, sit down and play it, it feels like a new Fallout game. But there's no one type of Fallout fan. We've talked about this around the office a little bit, too. There's no one type of Fallout fan, is there? No, not at all. Um, and if you look... You know, look at the old games, you're, you're coming from um, an isometric, more turn-based type thing to what today is a, um, you know, it has more adventure elements in terms of exploring a world and, and what that means to feel like uh, living in that world. And that's something that still is very important to us at the studio in terms of for the time you're in it, it has to feel real despite it being a video game and, and stuff like that. Sure. And that's what sucks you in when we, when we play it. Um, it's, it's reached the point in the office where, re really, we don't want to stop playing it. It has a very slow burn, um, but you feel like, I am this person in this world, um, and learning how to survive and learning how to conquer it, um, it's very rewarding. The other big question I have is, why now? Why is now the right time for an online Fallout? Um, well, we figured we wouldn't do it till we had done 70 more versions of Fallout. So we went right to 76. <laughs> Here we get to, um, I don't know if there's a good answer for that. We had talked early on. We had, uh, you know, um, talked with Chris, who was down in Austin, the team there. We had, we had some ideas of what multiplayer could look like. 
We started that during Fallout 4, really on paper. Um, and, and Chris and some of the other folks in Austin actually started before, right when we were starting to finish uh, Fallout 4 um, in 2015 to see, you know, how it could feel, what it could look like. Um, and it, it kind of grew from there. Yeah, it was, it was great. It was uh, taking, you know, a game that we love, Fallout 4, um, and then actually uh, grabbing some network code from one of our, our sister studios, id. We're, we're using the Quake 3 networking architecture, which is great, um, and then bringing it into the game. And then this one is for you, Jeff. You've got, you've got a herd, many cats in your role. And now you've got these cats that are not just in Maryland, and not just in Montreal, and not just in Austin, but yesterday we announced that uh, we have BGS Dallas as part of the family. So you've got a team spread across North America. Yeah. Thank you. How are you not pulling your hair out? Oh, I am pulling my hair out. Um, but it's, you know, it, it's amazing. There's such, so many talented people across these teams with great leadership. And, you know, this has been a learning curve for me, too. It's my first online game. So without guys like Chris and Mary who have done it for years, I'd really be lost at sea. Um, it, it's just a, it's an amazing experience to be able to go to Montreal and work with the folks who are doing all the graphics and then back down to Austin, all these gameplay and, and network code e experts. It, it's bringing this all together in a way that has been, it's, it's been a, it's been a, it's been a, a three-year project, right? So it's gone and gone and gone. And we've done this really quickly. We iterate really fast. And everyone is really good about communicating. And we fall short here and there. But... We all have what's best in mind for the game is always our number one thing, not ego. So we always focus on that goal, and we're, we're so excited to share it with all of you. And for you, Chris, uh, you recently joined, or relatively recently joined the BGS family. What's it like, the culture here, and how, is your, uh, how did you adapt to, to becoming part of the BGS family? Once I got over the, the, the awe of actually being a part of Bethesda Games uh, franchise, they make franchises that I've loved forever, uh, starting with Morrowind. Um, but after that, um, adapting to their culture, they're a very iterative studio, which I like. Um, I love that we, we play the game every day, sometimes all day, <laughs> um, and, and keep making improvements um, every time uh, we make a new build. And that's, it's a great culture, uh, a great thing to be a part of. I love working with all of these guys. That's great. So, you brought some new stuff, Todd. And to be honest with everyone out here, I only saw this stuff maybe an hour ago, so it's still fresh to me, too. Uh, stuff about the character progression, yeah, perks, and whatnot. Why don't, why don't you tell us what yeah, we're we, about you to Yeah, you know, see. look through the questions everybody has about the game. One of the big ones is, how does the character system work, um, given that it's an online multiplayer game? So um, we have a bunch of stuff to show you all uh, in the game, uh, uh, how the character system works. And uh, we'll, we'll go through and explain it. Um, one of the things that we're doing, we showed a little bit of it at E3, the... Um, you will emerge videos from our friends at vault -Tec. And so we've done these videos um, for several sections in the game, and we thought we would show you first here at QuakeCon uh, the one that deals with perks. So we can roll it. <laughs> Today's episode, Being a Better You. In life, we must each deal with the hand we are dealt, performing our assigned role to the best of our capacity. But after total atomic annihilation, you may find the hand you were dealt has been reshuffled. Yes, gone are the simple days of yesteryear. Now the common workman must also be a covert operative. The farmer, a master of the martial arts. The ice cream man, a nuclear physicist. How will you make sense of it all? Simple, turn to your official vault Tech training materials. With these powerful tools in hand, you'll learn to make the most of your natural abilities and better understand what makes you special. Use them to be the best you you can be, or someone even better. Your survival depends on it. With your future secure, share your newfound knowledge with others for great benefit.
But remember, there's power in diversity. Sometimes who we are isn't a choice at all. In fact, at a particular point in your young life, you may notice that your body has begun going through certain unfamiliar changes. No, it's not puberty, it's mutation. Thanks to our old pal, radiation, your DNA has become more interesting. See here? You've now gained the unique abilities of a marsupial in exchange for a mild neurological impairment. Now you've learned how to be a better you. You are completely prepared to achieve your full potential in the role of your choosing. As a hand-picked resident of Vault 76, it is your duty to carefully review your Vault Tech provided films yearly to fully prepare for the day when you will emerge. Okay, Todd, that was a lot of fun, but I think we all have more questions now. Yeah, it's... Uh... We'll take a little bit of a deeper dive here, and there's a, there's a lot to go through, and um, we'll do our best to explain it. Uh, the video does a great job of, you know, selling the idea, you see parts of it. Um, the mutation part, you know, is, is pretty fun. Your character can actually get mutated. Um, but the, the perk system and how you develop your character, we've done a lot of uh, interesting things there. But let's, let's just jump right in um, and show you uh, a little bit of the character creation when you first start. Um, you wake up in the vault, it's reclamation day. We have a full, you know, customize your character like we've had before. Um, it's even better now. And... Uh, let's Thank go you. a little bit. <laughs> you get to take your ID badge. We, we've added this uh, photo mode in the game that's really, really cool. The photo mode allows you to change your field of view, zoom in, zoom out, add, you'll see all the filters that are coming up. You can do this both here when you take your badge, it's like a training tutorial for it, and then you can do it anytime you want out in the wild with your friends, with dead enemies, with live enemies. Um, we have also added this to our load screen system. There's not a lot of loads in our game, but when you fast travel, there's a little one. And so any of the pictures you've taken there will pop up like a random deck with, along with our curated photos. Um, we, we really, this is, came out of a game jam. We do these game jams in the middle of projects to see what new features we want to try to add in. And this was one of our favorite ones. Yeah, it turned out, it turned out really, really great. Um, and, and fun for socially shareable stuff too, even exactly. offline. You, you share could, it, you, you could kinda... with your friends. Um, and so, you know, again, make your characters a whole host of it. You can take pictures where you want. You can also, anytime in the game, change how your character looks. Because you, you know, you're going to play a character for a long time, and you can, you can swap out, change your sex, anything, your hair, everything, um, just so that you don't feel like, well, I, have to I don't like how I picked in the very right. first second what I look like. Um, and uh, really, really cool feature. Next, we have, we'll show you stepping out of the vault and the okay. first level up and kind of dig into that some. So you get your, if you hit level two when you step out, you kind of complete the initial vault thing. And the first thing you do when you level up is pick a special that you want to increase. Um, if you played previous fallouts, we have all the seven specials. And after you pick the one you want to increase, you then pick a perk in that special. So here we're choosing Gladiator, uh, which is a melee perk. And then that is a card. As you can see, the, the perk system, are, the perks are cards and then you equip those, and every special is a pool of points for the cards you want to equip, and each card has, you know, I don't want to say mana cost, but a point cost right. for how powerful that card is, and do you have the right special for equipping it. Right, and is it flexible, or, or, or am I jumping ahead? Do you have... We, there's some more on that we can, we right. can get into and show you uh, how flexible it is and why we made some of the choices that we, we did. But let, let's keep going, okay. and then we can spend some time when sure. we see a more complete character. Okay, this is a level up to level four. So we've, we picked some more cards. We wanted to show you how the cards themselves rank up. Okay. So you can pick that card again. So by picking Gladiator again, you can then combine that card with the other one to create a more powerful version 
but it costs more points. Right. So sometimes you may decide, well, I only want the one-point version equipped for my character build versus the more powerful two-point version because I'm using my strength stats in some other way. Um, and yeah, so I think that probably makes sense, yes. <laughs> um, I hope. Uh, but there's more uh, than four levels in the game. Either, yes. There, the levels keep going up and up and up. We don't want right. to make a game where you have to stop leveling. And, but we had to make some very interesting decisions of what that means for a multiplayer game for balance. So let's, let's run the next one where we see it, it's a much higher level character. Right. I think it's in the 40s. Um, so here we are, and you'll see a character that's much further along. Picking charisma. We can talk about charisma is interesting. Yeah. Um, here's a perk that lets mutations act better with groups. Um, and so you can pick any perk that you meet the requirements for when you level up. There's no randomness there. And here's what it looks like with a character that's further along. We've upped the cap for each special to 15 mm -hmm. from 10. That allows a, you know better balance for which cards you're equipping. And the cards right now go from one point up to five points in power. And then as you level up, more cards become available. I've got a bunch of questions okay, about that, but I will... there and oh, chat no? a little bit. Keep going. Okay. But uh, I wanted to ask about charisma. Should I ask that later? Or about good? We can talk about that now, yeah. Yeah, Chris, how does charisma work in an online game? If, if we're not talking about NPCs that you can influence, what... What, is, what does charisma do for you? And that, was, that was a very interesting discussion amongst the team to try to figure out what do we do with charisma. But it made sense in a, in a multiplayer game uh, that a player that invests points in charisma and collects those cards, um, they can share those cards with their teammates. So we've developed a system where that, that player that invests um, can become the person that makes your entire team more powerful uh, by sharing those cards. Um, we did throw a, f a few cards in there for the single player. I think we have one, it's Lone Wolf, as I recall. Lone Wanderer. Oh, Lone Wanderer, right, right. So if you can uh, still pick some charisma cards if, if you're more of a solo kind of player, but the person that plays in groups all the time will probably invest more there. Cool. Yeah, um, and you probably saw before, again, when you level up, you get, these are the cards that come into the sets you can pick from when you're level four or five, whatever. Right. Um, we also experimented with, well, how do we add some more fun to it and give you more choices? And so we have added, because they're cards, perk card packs. And every few levels, initially every two levels, you get a perk card pack, and that has a, four random cards. Again, you could have picked these, but it gives you some more interesting choice that you might not have picked to give you some flexibility in, in your character. And then later on, you get them every five. But let's look at a perk card pack opening, because they're a ton of fun. Um, we do have gold. That one's great. Um, we have gold cards that animate. Of course, you get a joke and a stick of gum. Nice. And um, <laughs> the gum, actually, for fun, is a very slight. It reduces your hunger for a while if you chew the gum. Nice. Um, and so they're a, they're a ton of fun. When you hit that level and you're like, oh, it's level six. All right, I get a pack. You get to pick your regular perk and then also see, like, oh, okay, I got these other ones. Is there something I want to swap out? And that's something good to talk about is, is the swapping right. um, of the perks. Right, because you mentioned that, you know, it, the packs help you discover something you might not have known you yes. wanted, but how flexible is the system, Jeff? You can, like, what, you can, can you, sorry, Gary. Go you, ahead. you can swap out perks anytime. Um, generally, again, to reiterate, when you level up, you pick a special. You get a point in that special, which is the pool of points that you can slot perks into. You also get to pick one perk per level. You, generally, you'll pick the perk from the special you chose, but you can also pick other perks if you have available points. And then the, these are wild cards. So every, every two levels from level zero, one to 10, and then every five levels after, you'll get one of those perk packs. And what they allow you to do is to experiment with some other builds and cards you might not normally have played. Remember, you do start with one point in each special, so you will have unused points from the beginning, too, where you can try just slotting these in right off the bat. What we have found is that that allows players to go, hey, what are these luck perks? And why do I really want to search containers for extra ammo? And as you play a survival game, you go, wow, getting extra ammo in containers is really valuable. Um, and those, remember, you can also share those perks. So if you have perks to share ammo and you share that on your team, every member of the team can then find more ammo in containers. And these all rank up. So eventually, you're getting like huge bonuses in the amount of ammo or food you're finding or your carry weight's a big deal in this game. A lot of 
a lot of interesting back and forth with developers on how much you can carry or not. And you know, you see those cards at first, you're like, well, that's not as cool as being able to do plus 20% damage with my pistol. But in a survival game, being able to carry more means you'll be able to carry more pistols. So <laughs> it, you know, there's, there's a lot of ways that that, that interplay. And it, it's, there are so many cards in here, hundreds. And yeah. you're able to really do these cool builds and swap things in and out. And then yeah, I'm on a team. I have a great perk for this team that I might not want to carry. Lone Wanderer is a perfect example of that. Lone Wanderer, you, as soon as I, I play that when I'm playing solo all the time, because it gives me a bonus to my experience and damage. And as soon as I get on a team, I turn that off because I'm on a team now. It doesn't work. And I'll equip a different card that I can share with my team. So when you say build, you're not really talking about uh, sitting there and, and having multiple kind of decks. You're talking about having more of a baseline and then making little changes here and there quickly and easily. Is that, is that a kind of a correct way of putting it? Or? Yeah, your character, you're still progressing the way you would expect in an RPG, and it's kind of growing and growing and growing. So it's kind of what Jeff was saying. You're swapping out a thing here or there. The perk packs can also sometimes give you a perk that is, we intentionally do this, you might get one or two that from a pack of cards that is a higher level than you are. So it's like a few levels in shooting distance. So you say like, oh, I didn't even know that was a perk. Maybe I want to pick agility on my next level up because the game has given me this other perk and I just want to try it out. The other thing is, this is the multiplayer part of it, that when you hit level 50, you don't get to pick any, you don't get to give out a special point anymore. So that doling out strength and all that stops at level 50, but you still get to pick cards. So that gives us a continuing thing where, OK, I hit level 73, and I'm still like, you know what? I never got to pick that perk, because again, there's hundreds of them. I'll go pick that one. I want to try it out. So you're not, but we're still capping the, you know, the power curve ramp that in our other games, like a Skyrim or a Fallout 4, just like your character keeps getting more and more and more and more powerful. And we knew we couldn't really have that in this one. To, uh, you talk about the discovery of perks, too, and how you might discover them in a card pack. You might see your friend using one that you never thought you'd use. Have any of you, in your own internal playtesting, found a perk that you never thought you would use that you're like, wow, this is really cool? Chris? All the, all the yeah. time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> any I, recent examples? Well, I, I remember when I first started playing the game, I did exactly what, what Todd alluded to, or, or Jeff, where I always picked the, the percent damage perk. Because right. I'm thinking, okay, I just want to do more damage. Um, as I played the game and discovered there's um, a lot of value in doing things like building up your camp um, and doing a lot of exploration and gathering resources, I started to actually take perks I would have never picked in a single player game uh, to reduce uh, the amount things weigh so that I can actually carry more junk. Um, so I can then bring that back to my camp. And I, and I find that I'd, I'd swap that out a lot. Um, like if I'm playing by myself and doing more exploration, I tend to use those kinds of perks. But if I play in a group, we typically um, have some objective in mind. It's something we want to go and kill. Then I might swap some of those out for the more traditional damage perks. Yeah, Jeff, anything for you that, that emerged recently that you didn't think you would use, but now you're using? Um, I can't think of anything in particular. I did get one of those weird mutations the other day, though. Um, they're a lot of fun, too. So I was playing, and all of a sudden, when you have a lot of rads is when you're susceptible to mutations, like in real life. And then I got a mutation called Bird Bone, but I didn't realize I'd gotten it. And all of a sudden, I was over-equipped, which is always a frustrating experience in a game. And I'm like, why am I over-equipped? And I looked, and I had this perk, and it let me jump extra high, but it, but it lowered my strength. Um, so again, like the way the dynamic systems work is incredible. And um, you can spend a lot of time in that perk menu, but remember, it is a live game, so make sure you're in a safe place. <laughs> and then I have another question. Who gets to write the jokes in the gum wrappers? Uh, that is Emil Pagliarolo. Or, you know, he does all of the, the jokes. The master of the, the, the memes. He, he's done that for yeah. us for a long yeah. time. He wrote the arrow in the knee. That, that wasn't really a joke. What? Um, <laughs> yeah. Became a, it became a joke. It wasn't a joke. <laughs> <laughs> that poor guy. Um, <laughs> so Emil, Emil wrote all of those. So let's switch gears. I want to get to some of the questions that we've gathered up from the community. I'm going to call this the thunder round. Usually we do a lightning round, but we've got a half hour here. We're going to take our time. We're going to thunder through some really tough questions that we gathered up from, from the community. Um, Let's start with the big one, the beta. Mm -hmm. Now, you guys want to play, am I right? Yeah! 
why can't you let them play any sooner, Todd? Um. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of chatter. <laughs> I'll pack up my stuff. Um, look, we want everybody to play it as soon as possible. Uh, we're playing it now. There's a lot we have to do, right? We, we, there's things that, that we know we need to change um, and fix before we get it in everybody's hands. And the other thing is, even though people are going to start playing the beta in October, um, this is a game that we're going to be constantly updating. So everybody's feedback um, is really, really important to us. The beta for us, this is an all new thing, right? So we need to stress test a lot of systems. Right. Um, and we're, that's why we called it the break it early test application, because um, it's going to break. Oh, you're going <laughs> to um, We're pretty sure of that. And uh, get ready. <coughs> and, and so it's really, we, we need to get, make sure we're ready for Everybody comes in, it all crashes the first moment. Um, see, I make it sound fun, right? It's going to be really fun. Uh, <laughs> and then, you know, making sure we're ready to fix that really, really fast and, and, and so that we're in a good loop of, hey, here are the issues. Uh, let's fix them and get everybody else in the game as soon as possible. I want to pick up on something you said uh, just to reinforce it. You, you mentioned that this is a live game. Of course, we're going to continue to work on it. Your feedback still matters. Because I know that that was something that I think some of the community were concerned about. Um, yes, everybody wants to play it sooner than later, and I'm with you. Uh, but, you know, you will continue to work on this game, or you have plans to continue to work on this game and evolve it. It's not like it's finished, and then you're going to take one little round of feedback. You have lots of thoughts and plans, and we don't want to get into the roadmap, but... Right. Um, we, we do have kind of a, a roadmap in our heads, and this is a game that, that we think, uh, with the community, is going to be a very different game a year after it's out, and two years after it's out, and five years after it's out. Um, it's a game 10 years, 50 years. Um, it's, uh, we, we have big plans and what we can do um, with the game and with our community, and the beta is just really the, the first step. The first step. The next big one, PvP. I think everybody is excited, anxious, concerned, highly anticipating, nervous. You've talked about it a little bit here and there, but why don't you just take it from the top? How does it work? What's the deal with griefing? How are we going to be able to enjoy our Fallout game? Or how am I going to be able to screw up somebody else's Fallout game and get away with it? Or any variation on that. I'll just leave it to you to... This is why I don't go on Reddit. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, we will do our best to sort of explain where we're coming from with PvP. We agree with those. Like, we have folks in the office, we have that debate, you know, is it a, you know, what is it? Where do we want the, the, the player's kind of um, driving force? Is it a, a PvE world thing? Is it the other players? And for us, it is both. How can, how can we do both? And so th the first thing I, we'd say is that we want this element of danger it sounds weird to say, without griefing, which is like, okay, those things are often in conflict. So right now, and you've seen it in some of the E3 videos, when you shoot somebody, you do a little bit of damage. You don't do mm -hmm. full damage. It's like an invitation. It's like, like slapping somebody in a bar. <laughs> like, I, you don't want to fight? Um, <laughs> and like, that's annoying. And eventually, you're like, yeah, I think you know, yeah. we're going to. And so you do little <laughs> bits of damage. If you engage, then you're doing full damage. And there's a cap reward based on the player's level. So if the player's really high level, you're going to get more caps than if they're low level. Um, if you want to, after each one of them dies, you can seek revenge, which doubles the incentive. So the guy kills you, and you're like, well, that was annoying. Then the game says, hey, if you want to seek revenge, they're going to give you the double reward. It's like, okay, maybe I want to engage in that. Um, and that's really, really fun. The issue is when you don't want to engage in it, right? Someone's coming right. up to you, and they're slapping you and slapping you and slapping you. Um, and you're like, I really don't want to deal with this right now. Um, we have a lot of ways you can get away from them, but we still like it where they do, if they keep going at it, they have the ability to kill you, which sounds terrible, it right? It does. Like, like, why would you do that? Uh -huh. um, we like to turn that into a dramatic moment. So the player that kill somebody that didn't want to engage in it, um, then becomes a wanted murderer. They get no reward. <laughs> That's like the first applause of the panel. Yeah. <laughs> murder! <laughs> um, 
And so there is no reward, you get no caps, you get no XP, you get nothing for becoming a wanted murderer, except for the kind of social incentives people have online to be assholes. Right. Um, <laughs> which no. evidently, there's going a few. Um, so <laughs> what do we do with that? We turn the assholes into interesting content. So they appear on, <laughs> they appear on your map as a red star. Everybody sees them, and they have a bounty on their head that <laughs> <laughs> and that, that bounty comes out of their own caps. Oh. <laughs> and they can't see the other players so, <laughs> on, on the map. Um, and we did this, we had this idea, like, let's, let's turn it. Like, like, let's make them interesting content, and it is... When this happens, when any, anybody murders somebody while we're playing in the office, everyone sees on the map, and it is like, they're, it's awesome. Like, Tell, yeah, that's one of my favorite yeah. stories there. So the other day we had a big a test, an internal test, and we had played for hours, and towards the end of the test, I had leveled up. I had actually started early, and so I was higher level than a lot of the other people, and I saw that red star, and I was, I was almost about to log off, and I was like, oh, now I'm gonna get somebody. So I had built a sniper rifle, right? I found a, hunt, a hunting rifle on a super mutant, and I built a little scope, and I extended the barrel, and I was like, I finally get to use this. So I fast traveled near them. Now, on the map, remember, you see where they are. It's not super up, it's, it's a little relative, so it's not super pinpointy, but you'll know generally where they are. So I'm sneaking, sneaking, because when you sneak in our game, your, your appearance on the map disappears, no matter what state you're in, except for wanted. So I'm, my pip doesn't appear, and I'm sneaking, and I see him in a building, and I, and I see him moving around, and he comes wandering out, and I took his head off with my sniper rifle. Ah. And he drops down, I go running up, I loot his junk, I dance, took a picture over his corpse, and <laughs> logged off. <laughs> <laughs> So, what happens when you die, though? What happens when someone kills you? Like, Chris, why don't you jump in? What, like, if somebody, if, if I decide to engage, or even if I don't engage, am I punished if I die, or, 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 or there's got to be something? Yeah, for, for a long time, we tried testing where there was no punishment at all. Um, and, there was, and that took all the sting out of death. People used it to their advantage to travel back to, to various points, and it, it didn't feel right. Um, but we didn't want to, to make it too punitive because we do expect people will die um, and there's no save games like a single player game. Um, so what happens when you die is uh, you just drop your junk. Um, and, and junk isn't, isn't worthless. You, you need junk to, to build things in your camp or to make better guns or to make better armor. Um, so what it does is it creates a loop um, where you go out and explore, you create some junk, and if you happen to die, that's, that's all you drop. You don't lose your, your awesome power armor or any of the guns that you've collected. But then you have to make a decision. Is like, was that enough junk uh, that I need to go back and get it? Um, or is that something I can live without? Um, and what, what people will do is they'll go back to their camp and they'll, they'll put their junk back in their stash, which is safe. Nobody can, can take things out of each other's stashes. And we've also seeded the world um, with stashes as well. So if you know where some of the stashes are, it's always a safe place to, to store the junk that you've collected. So just enough so it'll sting, a, a but little not bit enough of a sting. so that it'll really deeply hurt And yourself. it's also a little bit of a reward for, right. for if you manage to kill somebody, there's usually something there with yeah, them. Nice. And it's the amazing. thing with junk is it's nothing that you can't just re-get by if you just keep playing. Like, right. that's that pile of it. But if you just start exploring, you'll collect more. So it's sort of like, well, that was sunk time. Do I want to go back and get it? And it's... Right. That happens on PvP, so if you do kill somebody, their junk drops and you get to pick it up. You get the caps from them, right. you can take the junk, but um, yeah. But it's just a little grindy time and you got it back. If, if it's the junk, you know, we like it, we put it in, and yeah. it's just enough to make it where before you head into a dangerous area, bef before this, you would just run into a dangerous area, you don't really care, there's no penalty to death, it's like you just fast travel back. Um, and then once we did that, you, so you just stop a little bit like, well, don't want, don't want to take a moment and like, collect myself, store the junk before I head into danger. If anyone remembers Fall Out 4, screws are very valuable. So yeah. if you've got screws in your junk, you want to store them. Yeah. You and can't how, decide between, like, yeah. this awesome-looking gun or a desk fan. Like, <laughs> they both have equal. <laughs> how does respawning work, by the way? If you, if you, if you die in a, in a dangerous area, but can you respawn anywhere? What, what goes on there? Um, respawning always takes... Uh, you can respawn anywhere you've unlocked, just like Fallout 4. You can fast travel wherever you'd like. 
Um, the closest point to you is free, and the entrance to Vault 76 is free. Beyond that, um, you have to pay caps based on how far away it is from you. So if you decide you want to take that opportunity to go way far to a corner of the map, you're going to pay a small caps cost. You know, thinking of the vault, going back to PvP, it doesn't kick in until level five. So that gets people into the game a little bit and, and understanding it before people start saying, hey, do you want to fight? Do you want to fight? Because otherwise, they just hang out. Because people, everyone comes out of the vault. So right. you would just like set up your camp and all the turrets. That happened for a while. You're like, <laughs> uh -huh. I'm really excited. I got the game. <laughs> Remember, for, for people who have more questions on PvP and can already see some exploits that might not be fun, we do allow you to ignore and block players, too. So you can actually, when you die, or at any time, honestly, but especially when you die, we have an option there for if you're just done with that, you can ignore them for that session. Then they can't see you on the map. They, they, can't, they, they won't be able to still mess with you, generally, unless they, unless they can find you. But this is a very big game. It's very hard to find people unless you know exactly where they are. You can fast travel easily. We also are entering a pacifist flag, so your bullets won't do that slap to people. So you don't have to worry about, I'm fighting something, some idiot jumped in front of my bullets and tried to get me in PvP. We're, yeah. we're allowing you to turn that off, too. People were uh, <laughs> abusing that in the studio. Yeah, the, the pacifist flag. Well, no, they would no. wait till you go to shoot a creature, and they would jump in front of the bullet. Right. Yeah. We, uh, we, yeah, <laughs> we, we, uh, we had our QA team. I asked the QA team, several hundred people, during one of our sessions to be the biggest assholes they can one session. We got a lot of good notes out of that, of things we need to fix. <laughs> QA knows how yeah. to play the game. Yeah, they, they oh, know well. how to play the game. I do have one more question about PvP, which is if you are a higher level character with higher level uh, armor, higher level weaponry, how, how do I even have a chance? And I get the slap mechanic, but if I want to engage and I'm a lower level character, am I just going to get destroyed instantly? We did. We struggled with that. So what we've done is there's two sort of power curves. You have the usual power curve against creatures in the world that you're used to um, in our games. And then, so if you take a power curve from like low damage to high damage, in PvP, we normalize it, okay? So the, like just a knife is gonna come up in damage and the really powerful things are gonna come down. So they feel right, but the death in PvP is, is quicker and it works the same for armor. Um, so if you play other multiplayer games, the guy in power armor with a minigun is obviously gonna be harder, right. but if you get the drop on him with a knife, it, it does kind of work. Um, and it, it, it makes it more fun without it being, well, I have no chance whatsoever, again, there's still a ramp there, it's just, you know, right. normalized. Cool. Noobs. And you get the caps, oh. all right? So that's the other thing, is right. do I, why do I want to go try to kill a level 100 person in power armor with my, when I'm low level, is that my reward is going to be way higher. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah. Nukes. Very cool. <laughs> it's a little feature. <laughs> But what happens when we're nuked? I mean, we know that things happen. We know that the, the area gets irradiated. Things are destroyed. There's uh, higher level loot, higher level enemies. But let's say I have a camp in, in that area. What happens to my camp? Uh, how soon can I rebuild it? Uh, we, Chris, um, why don't you jump in? Yeah, we, well, first of all, nukes are very cool. All right? they're, they're one of the coolest things that happen in the game. Yeah. Um, but we, we don't want it to be overly burdensome to a player um, to lose all their, all their stuff, so that we don't. Um, when, when you nuke a, a camp, it does destroy the structures, but we've created something called a, a blueprint system, um, so that if you spend you know, hours uh, making a really cool house with lots of detail, um, you can blueprint that house. Um, so it's very easy to replace it in the event that it, it gets destroyed. Uh, by a nuke. Um, it also makes it very easy to move your camp. So even if we're not talking about destruction with, with nukes, if you decide you want to relocate your camp to a different part of the map, and you can pack it all up and you can put it somewhere. And of course, the terrain is going to be different, but because you've blueprinted uh, your house, then you can usually find a way to, to, to jimmy it so that it looks good right. when you're replacing it. So it's, it's very easy to get back to where you were. So you, the, other, the other thing with yeah, that right. is that the camp destruction part is really it, it's easy to repair it if you want to leave it where it was, but we did the, the camp destruction exists. It's not really for like, hey, go blow someone's camp up. We realize when we put it in that that is a griefing mechanic is like someone wanders by and then you build a camp and you like imprison them. Now they have no way to get out. <laughs> oh. So they need an ability to damage the walls just to get out of the prison you have built for them. <laughs> right. So it has less to do with, hey, we want other players to come and blow them up. 
Um, the camp is also good for PvP, where someone engages with you and you lure them back to your camp. There's Ashley Chang in the studio. Um, you can build uh, like musical instruments, and he's he built his camp, and he's sitting in the middle of a road playing a tuba. Huh. And he's on this platform, and he's like, burp, 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 and he had built all these turrets in the foliage you can't see. And everyone's just like, this guy in a tuba. Like, <laughs> and then the turrets are like, and he's just like killing everybody. He's like, burp, 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 the whole time. It's awesome. Um, I forget where I was headed with that. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what the answer yeah, is. We, oh, the, the oh, camp, the yeah, camp right. intersecting with PvP stuff. Right. And the other thing with moving it around, it, that was key because the game's so big, you come out of the vault and you find a place where you're like, this is where I'm going to build my camp. And then you play like four more hours and you're like, I shouldn't, like, this view, I like this place better. So people right. tend to put their camp down and then as they progress through the map, they are finding new areas and then they kind of settle in like, okay, I really like this spot. So you move through the world, you meet friends, you're playing with others. How does communication work? Because I know that you've put a lot of thought into that, and that's even evolved a lot in, in recent days, months, weeks. It has. We, and this was in the E3 stuff where we had the emote wheel we have, where you, do, you can emote, and we have the, you know, the Vault Boy cartoon. It's really fun. We were big on communicating in, in a nice way with strangers. Um, and that, that's, we've had some successes there but we have found that we weren't giving the other players, even if they were strangers, uh, an, the ability to really be as interesting as we wanted. So now we're adding, uh, you have, you've, we've had voice chat for your teammates, and now if you want to turn on your mic, we have voice chat for all of the strangers, um, which, which really lets them communicate, and that's a very, very different dynamic in the game. Yeah, area-based, so people around you will hear you talk. Yeah. And, and you can mute that, too. <laughs> Any interesting chatter around the office in your own play tests? Any what? In your own play tests. Any interesting there's, there's chatter? There's always interesting chatter, yes. and there's always cool photos that people are putting up from photo mode. I mean, it's, it's a really fun game to play with people. I think I remember it was just a, a few weeks ago I got to a point that was, was really hard, so I waited till lunchtime and then gathered a bunch of people. It's like, hey, I, you need to come help me with this part. <laughs> so we get a bunch of people logged in at lunch, and then we go and kill the super mutants. Or... Cool. Let's talk about VATS. Uh, how exactly does VATS work? If it's an online game, it's more of a real-time, everything's happening in real-time. What, what, how does VATS work? Um, it's it's real-time. We now, initially, you can't target body parts. That's a perk. Okay. Because it's real-time, like getting all the parts at first is kind of hard. So we did it where it's, you get the whole body, you get the percentage based on your perception, and it's incredibly, incredibly useful. Um, and so... We did that, and it, it, it plays really, really well, so we're happy with it. Yeah, it's not just useful to um, target and hit enemies, it's also to find them. Yeah. So you use that a lot to try to, you know, I heard something shoot at me, where is it? Because obviously the game in certain areas is much more lush than our previous game, so things are very hidey. You don't know quite where they are. I mean, the thing I personally love about bats, I'm not the most skilled twitchy player, so uh, it allowed me to become a much better player in a game like Fallout. I mean, is that something, so, so for those who want to engage in combat, does it still help them in the same way? It does. Because it's based on your perception, and perception starts at one now, right. it's not as useful out of the gate. And, but then if you, the point is, if you invest, I'm a perception character, those percentages do cross a line where, oh my gosh, I'm definitely more accurate using this than I am just doing it on my own. And we, we try to strike a, a, a good balance there. An easy question. I think we might have even mentioned it in the past, but who's doing the music for, for Fallout 76? Ian Onzer, who's done the music for our other games. He's amazing. The soundtrack is uh, spectacular. Yeah. <laughs> and we have a lot of uh, licensed music as well. So we have more tracks than we've ever had in a Fallout game. Um, so there are radio stations you can listen to. Um, something we've loved uh, in the series, and it's always fun to go through and say, like, okay, what are the classic tracks we want to have? And then there is an unbelievable amount of just bizarre old 40s music. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh yeah, there's some wacky, like, some wacky stuff. Um, and it's great for Fallout. So sometimes it's like, hey, what's the mood of this song? And then other ones are, hey, this is the song that has, you know, this kind of you know, the slant on the lyrics as it appears in Fallout when it's post-apocalyptic make it really fun. We know Fallout 76 is an online game. This question has come up a lot. 
uh, on places like Reddit. What about private servers? Um, <clears throat> that is definitely something that we are doing. Um, we're committed to it. Modding for us, it's not just having a private server, it's um, being able to mod it. So mods for us have really been, you know, once our games come out, that that's what our, our hardcore players play. Um, and they're still playing, you know, Skyrim and Fallout 4, two of the still most popular games in the world, and a lot of people are playing mods. And so that is something that, given the online nature of it, is going to be very, very complicated, but we're committed to it, and we've been, you know, starting to design what that system is going to look like. Um, but it is, it is, you know, it's a, I will say this, it's a complicated problem, but one that we are 100% committed to, to solving. I, th I think that wraps us up. I think we, we got through the questions we had. Uh, any last words for the audience about uh, Fallout 76, what you're excited about, what you want people to experience? I just can't wait to see all these people in the game. Yeah, absolutely. We can't wait to play with you guys. I would say really it's you know, seeing everybody here um, and what our fans have meant to us. Uh, this is the, part of our excitement. You know, whenever we do a game, we try to make the game that we would really want to go out and, and buy ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, and this one is very, very different for us. We know it's different for our fans. But it's also the first game that we can really experience with them. And right. that, that part of it um, is really important to us. And uh, I, I don't think people really understand how exciting that is for everybody at all the studios. Yeah. It's exciting for all of us. Thank you, Todd, Jeff, Chris. Thank you for being here. Thank you all for being here. Thank Fallout you. comes out. Fallout 76 comes out November 14 on PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and PC. We'll be sharing a lot more information soon. Thank you, and a big round of applause for our panelists. Thank you. Thank you.